So once again, I have Peter Berthelsen with me, uh, and today he is going to talk about the bee and butterfly habitat and what wow. they do and how they could help. So Pete, you want to take it from there? Yeah, well, first, thanks for joining up again. This has been fun. Um, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund is a nonprofit that probably just about everybody listening to this has never heard of before because it's fairly young, uh, but it's a nonprofit that actually provides free pollinator habitat resources. Have you ever heard the saying, there's no such thing as a free lunch? I have. have heard that one? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> while it's true, this is pretty close. Um, so I guess to, to tell you the story about this young nonprofit, at its core, it was formed by commercial beekeepers that would go to state and regional and national meetings and talk about bee health and how critically important access to high quality forage is. And there was a general frustration over how lots of the conservation programs that were promoting pollinator habitat, one, were really, really expensive. Two, were, had some interesting design to them. And that led to really kind of producing not the greatest pollinator benefits in terms of pollen and nectar and foraging attributes and that sort of thing for honeybee health. And it was like, you know, this isn't rocket science. We, we know what honeybees need uh, for healthy forage. We know that all kinds of critters use those same plants and benefit from it. And yet, it's so hard to get those kind of seed mixtures on the ground. So that kind of conversation, and, and I, you know, my guess is, Mike, that you've had those same kind of conversations. What beekeeper hasn't? Well, uh, uh, a handful of really dedicated, smart commercial beekeepers came together. There might have been some adult beverages and a meal involved in the conversation. <laughs> Lubricant. We like to call that social lubricant. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, you know, the conclusion was this isn't rocket science, you know, and really, while, you know, we're not going to have millions and millions and millions of dollars right out of the chute. I, I know I could pick up the phone and I could find places that would support an effort that would really have a substantive impact on honeybee health. That story, that background story, leads to the eventual form formation of this nonprofit called the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. And the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, uh, in its flagship habitat program, which we call Seed a Legacy, in that program, they offer one on one technical guidance to somebody that wants to establish pollinator habitat, because you and I have had long conversations about projects that look great, projects that didn't turn out so good, projects that I don't know how to manage it. We provide all of that. And on projects that are two acres in size or bigger, uh, you can get free pollinator seed mixtures. Free. So nice. there is no such thing as a free lunch, but this is at least a side dish that really is free. And so this really, really unique nonprofit came together with that sort of general goal. And uh, it now functions in the format that we kind of talked about on our last podcast with lots of innovation. I know of no other conservation programs, and I've been doing this for 37 years, no other conservation programs that take some of the unique approaches that the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund does. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but um, it's very unique. It's incredibly successful. We have four different research projects that are evaluating how important, how valuable are 
those bee and butterfly habitat fund seed mixtures when compared to other conservation programs or anything else there on the landscape. And cool. the cool story is really, really, really valuable. So that box was checked of uh, this isn't rocket science and we know we can make really impactful seed mixtures. So when did the bee and butterfly habitat fund uh, start? So in 2017, um, it kind of stuck the toe in the water, so to speak, with what we called a demonstration project in two states, North Dakota and South Dakota. Uh, in incredibly important for honey production. Those are, uh, you know, North Dakota is always number one. South Dakota is probably number two or three for honey production in the U.S. Lots of commercial beekeepers. And we knew that we would have a lot of interest from commercial beekeepers helping line up landowners that raise their hand and say, yeah, I would do that. You know, I'd put in a couple acres and that sort of thing. So we, so we picked those two states as a demonstration to prove the product, proof of product. One, our landowners interested. Two, do beekeepers benefit from it? Three, Will people financially support it? And then, um, you know, four is what's what comes out the other end of the pipe? What's the result? So how, I guess maybe explain, like, how how did it, like, form? Did it just happen to be that, you know, a couple of guys and gals just met at a conference and said, hey, no. we could probably do better than this? Or, or mm -hmm. you know, maybe run us through how, how it actually got off the ground. Yeah. So I'll... I'll try and I, I'm sometimes I end up being a little bit of a storyteller. So I'll try and that's not what to, I'm here for. <laughs> that's what I'm, I'm here for. To, yeah, I got the go. fishing rod. <laughs> I'll try not to go uh, too long, but you know, it, it wasn't one meeting. It was a series of meetings, but uh, the American beekeeping federation national meeting was probably ground zero for a lot of those conversations. And it was two existing nonprofits and then commercial beekeepers coming together, you know, and the nonprofits bringing the experience of, well, yeah, this is how a nonprofit would function. This is what uh, it would do. Project APSM was one of those nonprofits. And then uh, at that time, my current employer, Pheasants Forever, a nonprofit wildlife conservation group was the other one. And then those commercial beekeepers. And we came up with an innovative way of kind of combining all of those experiences and ability to administer a program and that sort of thing. And that, that's where we uh, test drove that thing. And, and it was very successful. Very cool. Well, one of the things that I noticed on um, the team was it looks like a fair amount of them are beekeepers uh, throughout uh, the United States, primarily the Midwest, I, I believe is what I noticed. And, you know, what kind of input are they bringing to the table in regards to, I mean, you've kind of, I know we talked about this in our other podcast where it's like, you've got the peer mix, you know, call it the pure native perfect yeah. um pollinator we refer, blend we refer to that uh mike as the monarch butterfly mix okay and then the other half of it we call the honeybee mix okay and we we had talked about that before but for the people listening just to this podcast this is one of the aspects of it that i know of no other conservation program that takes this approach when we work on a pollinator project you get two seed mixtures one is called a honeybee mixture, and it includes the plant species that honeybees thrive on, which are clovers, okay? Yep. And then what we call the monarch butterfly mix is 100% natives, because most of the clover species we use are an introduced plant species. So the, the other mix, it's all natives. There's a minimum of 40 wildflower species in it. Okay, and um, could be 50, 65 wildflower species, very diverse. And we include that diversity so that whether it's a hot year or a cold year, a wet year or a dry year, early in the planting, late in the planting, when you have that kind of diversity, 
something in there is always going to do well for you in any given year, regardless of what it's like. You know, before we hit the record button, we were talking about how dry it is where you're yeah. at and how dry it is where I'm at. I'm located in central Nebraska talking to you today. <clears throat> and when you design seed mixtures with that kind of diversity, lots of diversity uh, in there, you have that robust strength to that seed mixture that it can function that way. So the two seed mixture approach uh, was very unique. That suggestion came from a commercial beekeeper, one of the smartest folks uh, that I know uh, with Browning Honey Company. His name is Zach Browning. And when we were talking about, well, you know, it's not that easy to necessarily design a seed mixture that has clovers in it and all these wildflowers that, you know, <clears throat> we're going to have people coming to us with broad, very broad interests in what they want out of it. And it, it's, it's just not that easy to, you know, sometimes you're kind of combining the Hatfields and the McCoys sort of thing into one house. So, so just he came up with that, that solution. And today it's like, you know, what, why didn't I think of that? Well, just that clarity or just for clarity, when you say two seed mixes, they are two mixes combined, correct? No, they are planted separately. Got okay? it. So <clears throat> I will share some photos with you that you can magically slip into our podcast today. But the honeybee mix establishes very, very quickly. <clears throat> the photo that hopefully folks are looking at right now while I'm talking is actually like two months post planting versus that honeybee mix with all those native Forbes species in there that are so much slower to establish. And again, we oftentimes use the phrase that in year one, that planting sleeps. In year two, it creeps. And in year three, it leaps. It's a, the, the timeline is entirely different. Both seed mixtures provide tremendous value for a wide range of pollinator species, but how they function, how they establish is very different. So on one part of the planting, we have the honeybee mix separate. And then on the other part of the project, we have the monarch butterfly mix, a separate planting, not, not combined, but in two different uh, pieces. And very often, I think we talked about this last time, we actually will design a project where we plant the honeybee mix in the middle of the field and around the outside, um, we plant the honeybee mix. Monarch butterfly in the middle, honeybee mix on the outside because that honeybee mix with the clovers in it can act like a green fire break. So the monarch mix is like the castle and the honeybee mix is like the moat around the castle so that we can more safely uh, apply prescribed fire to it. That's one example of how we could do it. Lots of flexibility and we're getting great results. Awesome. So one of the things that I had shared a couple emails with you, I think about a week or so ago, and it was around ultimately a pest that I thought maybe I had in my prairie. What, what do you, if any, see any sort of um, pests within any of those mixes? Well, sure, that, that kind of happens. Um, but again, when we have a highly diverse planting, it kind of addresses all of that. Um, you know, mother nature is a web. And so, you know, um, back in my former life as a pheasant biologist, you know, there would be people that would be like, um, I don't like hawks because I think they kill right. all the pheasants or I don't like foxes or whatever. Well, when you have high quality habitat, whether you're calling it pollinator habitat or pheasant habitat or whatever, it supports all the other things, the mice, the snakes, the rabbits, uh, grassland songbirds, the rabbits, and then everything works. Right. So almost everything that you want to talk about 
comes down to habitat. So one of the philosophies that the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund operates under is when we get an acre of habitat, we have to make it the best it can be. Okay. We don't have enough acres of it. So we, we just cannot afford to be putting our inputs into an acre of habitat, pollinator habitat, pheasant habitat. And it's kind of, mm, yeah, mm, mm, nah, it's okay. We can't afford that. It has to be the best of the best. And that's yes, really you, what we try to do. Yeah. And our last podcast, you'd mentioned that and that, that it's funny because that you say that again, because that stuck with me and it brings up a lot of questions and besides the maybe obvious why is, well, maybe we'll just run with that for now. You know, why is it most important? Is it because there's limited ability to transform habitat or is there something else? Mm -hmm. Well, there's all kinds of reasons. You know, you said transform habitat. Once you've planted seed in the ground, your ability to kind of make major changes is very limited. So the seeds that we put in the ground, we need to put a lot of thought to it. And without trying to throw a stone at what is the largest, most successful conservation program in the history of the country, the Conservation Reserve Program, if you think about that program, you know, today there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 24 million acres of that across the country. Well, if that were a higher quality habitat, um, just think what that could do for pollinator health and pheasants and quail and grassland songbirds and all that kind of stuff. I mean, if you Does were to it, guess, maybe you'd know the answer. What kind of impact has that had from a per acre standpoint? Well, I think that there's three objectives to CRP, uh, soil, soil health, soil quality, water quality, and wildlife. And they're not in that order. They're three co-equal objectives. I think yeah. the first two, uh, the soil health, soil quality, and water quality uh, have been without question, huge successes. Okay. Cause generally speaking, that program, establishes a permanent vegetative cover on highly erodible lands. So right. we've saved a lot of soil. We've yep. improved a lot of water. We've kept a lot of chemicals out of water, that sort of thing. Huge success. I think where we have certainly had success, but there's so much more room for improvement is the wildlife quality, the wildlife habitat component of it. You know, and if you... And again, I, I hesitate to sound like I'm complaining about the program, but there is so much potential for right. additional benefits. If you, as a beekeeper, if you look at, you know, a 200 acre field that is in CRP and it's been there for a while and it's 100% grass, yep. how much value is that providing right. for honey production, for honeybee right. health? for all of that. And that's where there's just a real opportunity right. for it to be a little better. You know, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, as I stated before, and I have in several other podcasts, as an outdoorsman myself, I have walked hunt, probably hundreds of thousands of acres of um, primarily DNR or national forest land. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's always blown me away how it's nothing but grass. Mm -hmm. And as I walk through it, you know, you, other than the occasional, you know, song, not, I wouldn't even say songbird, um, sparrow. Well, I guess that's a songbird, isn't it? It's not a highly sought one. But mm -hmm. other than a lot of sparrows flying out of the grass, it doesn't hold much of anything. And I've mm -hmm. always kind of question it even before I got into honeybees why grass you know and I think as a young outdoorsman I was kind of trained to think that well this is what pheasants like well do you know how many pheasants I've jumped in not, <laughs> many. Lab? Yeah, not, many. not many and 
Um, where do I normally find them on those lands? Down in the cattails, you know what I mean? And a lot of that has to do with hunting pressure. But, um, you know, they're looking for cover and for food, right? And, and, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you're the expert here. And I just have always wondered, why can't we have both? Because, you know, I've got a little bit of experience with um, native prairie flowers and from my understanding and from my perspective, they appear to have the ability to hold the same amount of pheasants. Um, but outside of that, it, from a pollinator perspective with the grasses, it might as well be a desert. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> it's a very complicated uh, discussion to have. You know, that's like a whole nother podcast. So we can uh, check, check. L- l- line up uh, <laughs> podcast number three right, right now. But I'll, clo- I'll close with this. This is the aspect about things that got me so excited supporting the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund is that what is great, and I, I don't mean just okay or good, but phenomenal, great pollinator habitat is exactly what you want for pheasants and quail and grassland songbirds and the whole Noah's Ark list of all the other critters that are out there, you know, and just know that when you, you know, when you talk about pheasants and probably you had a a dog in front of you and a gun in your hand, when you were making those observations, that pheasants are a very, very, very short lived species. Okay. About 13% live to be one year of age. It's all about what have you done for me this year? Right. And so, and and so chick survive nest success and chick survival is key. And what do those chicks need to survive? They feed on small, soft bodied insects. And what do small, soft bodied insects want? They want one of two things, something that is flowering for nectar and pollen or a plant that is green and succulent that they can bite into and suck the sap out of it. That's pollinator habitat. Right. So it all comes together and that's why it's so exciting and there's so much opportunity. And that's also why um, I like to say the phrase that a rising tide floats all boats. Right. And, and, we put great pollinator habitat out there for the bees. We're going to check the box for all these other things too. Right. And I don't want to go down too much of the, you know, pheasants or other wildlife on a bee podcast, but um, I think that, you know, a beekeeper's mission can complement and, and provide huge benefits to other outdoors people and you know as you probably know outdoorsmen um provide more funding for habitat than anyone else in this country Mm -hmm. and so it's whether someone may think that beekeeping and outdoorsmen are two totally different subjects i would argue that we kind of have the same mission and we just don't realize it well and yes so one of the questions that that came up as you're talking about the grass is i've always thought you know grass is you know linear right comes out of the ground and it's for the most part sticks straight up where with um flowers you know they kind of come up and then you know provide their canopy right to collect Mm -hmm. sun from their foliage as well as the flowers do you know of any studies or maybe have any experience with um pheasant survivability as well as other uh, critters within a field that has just grass versus pollinator habitat. And the reason I say that for people that aren't hunters is as a hawk were to fly over, their vision can penetrate that grass, I would imagine, better than a canopy from pollinators. Well, it's it's even more basic than that, Mike. (laughs) If you think about a young pheasant chick. Yep. About that big. Teeny tiny. About that big. <laughs> yeah. Okay? And if you think about that chick's ability to forage looking for small, soft bodied insects, because that's what 95% of its diet is, and trying to make its way through that jungle of an area that is solid grass, 
number one, there's hardly any food. And number two, they can't make their way through it. Right. And, one of yeah. the benefits of pollinator habitat that we ascribe directly to what we would then call great brood rearing habitat for pheasants and quail is that there are broad areas that are actually open and bare ground underneath. Right. And uh, um, I can actually send you a little video clip to insert at this point in the podcast that actually shows that happening. I think and, it is, I think it might be on one of your YouTube uh, yep, videos. Yep. I've seen it, and it's it yes, tells the story. It does, it, it, and if and if you're a beekeeper watching this podcast and you see that video, it just immediately goes to chink, and you get it all right. And I, I would make uh, one other point to what you were talking about about uh, beekeepers being conservationists and all that kind of stuff. If you th- remember back to the story that I told about who at its core formed the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, commercial beekeepers. Well, this is called the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. Those, those in group of really intelligent, highly respected commercial beekeepers very, very quickly, early on assessed you know, this thing called the monarch butterfly and other things like that. We all want the same kind of habitat and we can work together to get this kind of stuff on the landscape. And so that was no small um, step and box to check in that early part of this young nonprofit for the commercial beekeepers to raise their hand and say, hey, We have to think bigger than just honeybees and we can do it and we can all work together and we can get more advocates for what we want on the landscape by being broader and more uh, open to all pollinators. It doesn't have to be an us versus them. I think today there is a little bit of honeybee versus native bee. Uh, you know, is there competition? Is there a transference of disease and parasites and that sort of thing that's kind of bubbling out there that uh, some pollinator groups like to talk about? I would but even argue it's not just bubbly, bubbling. I mean, there's some people in what you would call the spearhead position kind of championing some of those conversations. Mm-hmm. And I've got some concerns just as the broad effect of that. Yeah. And that that's where <clears throat> as a biologist, I immediately go back to when we get an acre of habitat, we have to make it the best it can be. And that rising tide uh, floats all boats. If we have better, higher quality pollinator habitat with the best possible pollen and nectar resources, it's going to benefit everybody. Right. And that's the approach that we take. Right. And my, so in my mind always goes as an entrepreneur, my mind's always going, okay, well, how do we make this bigger, better? And, you know, my first thought as we're talking here is, is there a way that we could get sports men and women involved to say, maybe the habitat we've been humping, which, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, walking through the grass with the dogs and the dogs jumping high <laughs> trying to see where they're going. Cause as you point out, it is not fun walking through some of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how do we get those people on, in on board to say, maybe we need to transform some of the stuff that we're funding. Yeah. So <clears throat> number one, uh, I'm going to give you a couple of solutions, you know, and I, I love the question, you know, number one is, having more people be in a position where they've actually heard of the bee and butterfly habitat fund, that's a step in the right direction. But then number two, the research that I referenced earlier, where we have four different projects that are out there right now that are looking at the value of bee and butterfly habitat fund seed mixtures versus uh, the U S department of agriculture, their pollinator program, um, National wildlife refuges, state wildlife management areas, roadsides, pastures, hay ground. They compared all of that stuff together. And the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund 
in every one of those studies was producing significantly greater pollinator outcomes for honeybees and native bees uh, than all of those other options that were out there on the landscape. So beginning to get that information out there a little bit further, I think can open the door to conversations about, hey, you know, is there a way to do how we've been doing habitat a little bit differently? And hey. that's a that's a slow process to get towards. Um, yeah. but, but it's really important because there's not enough habitat on the landscape. There flat out isn't. Right. And so when we get some of it, we have to make it the best it can be. We cannot afford to expect that honeybees or native bees or pheasants or grassland songbirds are going to thrive living off the scraps on the landscape. And that's what they're down to. They're down to the scraps on the landscape. Yeah. And, and, you know, as you see, you know, DOT projects and, you know, other concert, you know, DNR lands, um, and they all somewhat look a bit, a bit the same. And there's a reason for that, <clears throat> excuse me. And that, uh, reason, whether it's right, wrong for, I shouldn't even say right or wrong, you know, what the intent I guess is behind it. There's always an intent. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and typically a, um, well-intended intent, right? Like mm -hmm. I don't I hardly ever run into anyone with ill intentions. Um, and so it would be interesting to see. And, and like you say, it's, it would be a, well, it's a big shift to turn, right? And, you know, mm -hmm. momentum is not in pollinators um, uh, corner at the moment, but it would be nice to try to figure out how to start to slowly yeah. turn that ship. So I, I said it was complicated. I'll give you one example of how and why it's complicated. High quality pollinator habitat, if left to its own devices, could become pretty weedy quickly, okay? Things like thistle and that sort of thing, early successional stage plants. Well, if you are a state wildlife agency, you referenced the Wisconsin DNR earlier in this, and you are the person that wears the hat where I get to manage these properties. Yeah. And I got 20 of them that I have to manage. Okay. And because we went with this planting that in year one sleeps and in year two creeps and in year three leaps. And three. so in, in, in year one and two, I got all kinds of thistles yes. out there um, that is expensive to manage and it's very time consuming. And I have 10 properties. I have 15 properties that I have to manage. And how do I do that? Well, one of the ways that you do that is you, des you have to design and use a seed mixture that has a bunch of grass in it. Right. Because the grass establishes quicker and it outcompetes the thistles. It can be that simple and something that it like, well, I never, you know, as the person that doesn't have to manage the property, I never really thought about what the realities are of that kind of thing. So it's very complicated. Yeah. The good news is, is if we can have more of these discussions, okay, and where a private landowner or a corporation, you know, set the public lands aside for now, but uh, a beekeeper, a landowner where you set up an apiary, um, a corporation has as its interest, I want to have high quality pollinator habitat. We can do all that stuff. And that's where the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund comes in because we work on all of those projects, whether it's on private land, public land, or corporate land, which you should interpret as any land, it needs to be two acres in size or bigger. And we're doing a bunch of stuff on solar energy projects. Uh, that are going in, hike, bike trails, city municipalities where they have wastewater treatment plants that are all grass around it and they have to mow every seven to 10 days. Private landowners, it's just, there's lots and lots of opportunities for collaboration. The main thing is nobody's heard of the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund before because we're so young and so small. 
Right. Well, when you had mentioned about the two acres and larger uh, and providing free seed mix, I was like, I don't know why anyone wouldn't mm -hmm. engage that yeah. is looking at a project of that size. I mean, when you immediately said it, 10 people came to my mind that I'm like, these people need to know about this. Yeah. And I bet nine of those 10, if you talk to them, would say they've never heard of us before. Right. So it's, you know, that this, this nonprofit is growing, it's expanding, it's doing lots of great things, and we're highlighting them on social media and in a lot of ways. So people will uh, have heard of us, um, but right now we're, we're still uh, growing and uh, having a substantial impact. So what, so maybe talk about the front end, you know, how are you guys funded? You know, mm -hmm. how could people that are potentially listening to this that want to contribute could uh, get involved in helping increase pollinator habitat? Yeah, two great questions you asked there. The first one is how are we currently funded? <clears throat> I'll tell you the story that I described the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund as a big tent. And in that big tent, there's all kinds of opportunities for lots of entities that range from uh, companies like uh, Whole Foods, Costco, Target, um, to retail entities like uh, Pura Vida Bracelets, Nature Supply Company, Project Hive Pet Company, to foundations, to other nonprofits, to crop commodity groups, National Corn Growers Association, to ag industry, Bayer, Syngenta, BASF. And I give you those examples, Mike, because in that width that I just gave you, there are not many examples in the world where a bear and a Costco or Whole Foods are going to work together. They just aren't. But they come together under this big tent called the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. Throughout my career of trying to solve conservation program limitations. I've always been a lumper, not a splitter. I wanna find ways to bring entities together, okay? And unfortunately, <clears throat> I think unfortunately, in this pollinator world in which I now kind of live, there's too many groups that I think are splitters. They draw lines in the sand and say, you, you're bad. You produce chemicals that can hurt my bees. And so don't cross this line and come over here and you're part of the problem. Have agricultural chemicals had an impact on pollinator health? Without question. Does that mean that they should not be part of the solution? I believe that they, they not only should, but have to be part of the solution. If we want to come up with the solutions for honeybee health and success. Um, it's very complicated and it's going to have to involve agriculture. There's no way around it. You know, that's where we're, we're gonna have to work with agriculture to find those pieces where we can get the acres of high quality pollinator habitat on the landscape. So we have to work with agriculture. Right. So the second part of your question was how can somebody make a difference? And that I smile every time I tell this story because I think it's really cool. The Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund has this thing called gifts that grow, okay? And in gifts that grow, if you make a financial contribution to the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, and I'll just use $100 as an example, you make a donation of $100, there is one half acre that $100 will plant one half acre of pollinator habitat. And through our donation system, you select and customize an e-certificate that you customize and print out. And so here's the example. On Mother's Day, think of how many people buy a bouquet of flowers for their wife or their yeah. mother. Looks nice, last five days, whatever. For the same $100, you could establish one half acre of pollinator habitat that will be there for a minimum of five years, 
because that's what the contract length is, five years. Could be a lot longer, but at least five years. And you get a certificate to put into the card to present to that mother, that wife, that daughter, that whomever, as this is your Mother's Day gift. And in, in recognition of you, we've planted a half an acre of pollinator habitat. Very cool. Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, Christmas, anniversaries, birthdays. Um, I tell you how I personally use it the most is on those occasions when I've had a loved one that has passed away. Most people in my life are into this sort of thing. And as a family that has had somebody pass away and you get all these flowers okay? right. at the end of the funeral, it's like, you know, here, aunt, here, you take one cousin, you take one. Yeah. You know, appreciated. The thought was the most important thing. I give a gift that grows in recognition of that person. And when their family sees the certificate and realizes that I gave that gift in their memory to the rest of the family, and this is what the outcome is. And then I also have the option of just hitting a button and promoting that person who passed away and recognizing them. And I usually put a photo of me and them together on the Facebook page. Uh, it's, it all ties together. And the families that have gotten those sorts of things, the usually the response I get is, this is the perfect idea. And this is exactly what he would have loved. Cool. Well, we'll get that it's link like for gold. sure in our notes so people can go check that out. Cause I think that's a wonderful idea versus <clears throat> ultimately taking a flower out of our uh, mm -hmm. environment. And granted those flowers are growing a little different, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so Mike, when you're, you're going to have a, you're going to have a tremendous amount of post-production work on this one, because I'm going to say all uh, kinds that's of all right. stuff. That's all right. It makes me feel like I'm earning it. Um, cool. So you were talking about a minimum of five years Mm -hmm. Can you explain that? So is it that people yeah. that get the seeds, they record, they enter in a contract or? Yeah, we call it an agreement. <clears throat> it's a simple one page thing. And basically what they're saying is I'm going to manage it and I'm going to maintain it for a minimum of five years. And if, you know, for whatever reason they don't, then all they have to do is refund what the seed cost. Okay. Got it. So I, I, here's, here's a story for you. I, I think it will resonate. I spent my career working on conservation programs, things like CRP, where landowners receive an annual rental payment and that sort of thing. And sometimes it was a little frustrating that when the contract ends and the annual rental payment ends, it's gone. That planting, that project is gone. With the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, where there is no annual rental payment, we're giving you one-on-one -on -one technical guidance and we're giving you the seed and we're there to help you with management and provide guidance. That's what we provide. The motivation for why that project is going in is so different that when that five-year agreement ends, virtually every single one of those projects remains. Right. So we can't guarantee how long it is, but it's, a, it's an incredibly high percentage of them that remain. And I'll just also add that the number one criteria about what projects are accepted, it all comes down to site prep, Matt, Mike. <clears throat> and when that project has fully checked the box that that site is prepared and ready to go, they're getting free seed. Because um, it's just well, it's really, really important. Yeah. And I didn't participate in your guys' program. I really wish I knew about it, you know, several years ago, but um, we talked about it in the last podcast. We've talked about it a little bit offline, but, and I hate almost bringing it up again, but I've got You're not two alone. To three, or, right, got about two to three acres of prairie flowers. And that was told, I mean, like I said before, I'm, I would prefer not to use chemicals when I don't need to. Um, you know, I, I don't put anything in my lawn. I spray my apples with as close to organic stuff as I can, just so I can have apples at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and 
when they did our plot, they completely round up the entire hillside. Mm-hmm. That property or that prairie has been going on, I think, 15 or 20 years without a burn. And there is so little weed in there. Weeds, I should say. You never know from today's culture what weed. <laughs> but there's very little weeds in there. And I know it's sacred. And um, we almost we pretty much do nothing. I will manage some trees that sprout out into it. Cause we've got some mm-hmm. pine trees that'll, you know, they'll pop. In fact, we cut some down, we use them for our Christmas tree. Um, mm-hmm. And then I've got some, um, um, oh gosh, what is it called? Oh, shoot. black locusts that'll pop up in there and I'll manage those as well. Cause I don't want black locusts overtaking it. Right. But even in drought, you would not, you could never tell based off of that prairie, whether there's a drought going mm-hmm. on or not, because they, they're simply not affected because they're so well established because the site prep was done so well. Yeah. And so I know you have mentioned it multiple times, but I will attest that that made mm-hmm. a huge difference, at least for me. And I know yeah. that soil composition probably can affect the results for different people. Um, and that may be an aspect um, of my prairie that benefits it. I don't know. Uh, but I can just tell you on a hillside that on the top is rocky and sandy all the way down to loamy, dark soil in the bottom. And, and what's interesting is you can actually see which flowers prefer what, because I've got yes. some that stay up high on the hill and them rocks. And there's still a few popping up down low. But in that loamy soil, I think it's like mountain mist. Mountain if that's mist. Virginia mountain, mountain mint. mint. Yeah, mm-hmm. really small white flower, but very mm-hmm. dense. Loves mm-hmm. that loamy soil, but it cuts everything off. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that site prep can, like you were just saying, if you make it past that five years, you know, all attest that we've got mm-hmm. one running on 15, 20 that we do nothing with. Yeah. So you have, nothing. You're, you're describing a project where everything has sorted its way out now. Okay. Yes. And, you know, the plants that like the high and dry and rocky versus the lower moisture and heavier soils, they've all balanced out. They have found their happy home. Um, and that's, that's a pretty cool deal when you get to that. Oh, and it's gorgeous. I mean, all year round. I mean, it's mm-hmm. a asset for our property without a doubt. And I think anybody that made the decision to go all in, would not be disappointed after, you know, the leap year. Yeah. So did you, were, were you the one that planted that? that we did not, the property? but we came with our property, our neighbor, um, who we've kind of got a unique situation. We've got, we live on 80 acres and with three other neighbors and each of us, so four neighbors own five acres ourselves. And then we share 60 acres that are in um, managed forest. And so the gentleman that created that proper originally created the, or developed the 80 acres, he helped the family that owned our property do it. And that's yeah. why I know so much about it. Well, I was going to just say that if you weren't there, one of the things that you would have seen is that in the first five years, it didn't look like that. Right. And it would have been, <laughs> you might not have been singing its praises quite as loudly. And so that's the other thing that with the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, we like to encourage our people to set up photo points and to kind of document those changes throughout the year and over the years. Because when, when uh, you know, you're in 15, 17 years right now, if you had a time machine or you had a photo point, you could go back and see what it looked like from the same location every year, every time you're taking the same photos, you wouldn't even recognize it. It would yeah. be like, well, if you had some of those photos that we could add to notes, that would be really great to add. We just, we just may have those sorts of things. <laughs> <I> imagine. <laughs> Very good. So, you know, we're, creeping up here on an hour what maybe in your closing 10 minutes here what you what can people do you know do your pitch yeah <laughs> doesn't need to be an so, elevator pitch so yeah so I, tell us I think one of your stories <laughs> i think there's a number of things that everybody listening to this podcast can do 
First thing is, um, if you have an interest in pollinator habitat, or you know somebody that has an interest in it, get a hold of us and get some of our flyers that promote the Seed Legacy program and hand them out. You have a regional or a state beekeeping meeting uh, coming up. We would love to either present at it virtually or in person or to have materials that went out to everybody. Most people have never heard of us, so we still have to get the word out. That's number one. Number two, if you're part of a group that would like to hear more about this, we try to once a month put together a webinar that we promote uh, that's out there. And um, we would be happy to do a free webinar with your beekeeping group or whomever might be interested in this topic. Okay. That's pretty easy. That's number two. Number three, like and follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, um, Twitter, Instagram, you know, all yeah, of that. If we're watching this video, links down below. Otherwise, check the show notes and we'll definitely have all those links for you too. Yeah. So, you know, and I think for the, the people that we tend to connect most with, Facebook is probably still a pretty good venue by which to get the word out. Okay. Uh, and then uh, number four is think about that story about gifts that grow. And when you have a memorial, a birthday, anniversary, Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, Christmas, you want to recognize an employee, anything where you want to give a unique gift that is innovative and that makes a difference and will be there for a long time, you have the opportunity to customize that certificate that you will present to them for your gift. It's not just a, hey, yeah, I, uh, I gave $100 to something that you've never heard of uh, right. in your name. Have a great day. That's not, <laughs> that's, that's not how it is. Uh, it's an actual uh, certificate that will go in the card that you'll give them um, that will allow them to know, hey, this is a real deal. And that's really cool. And I just, I think it's really innovative and I think it's a great way to make a difference. Whether you're a beekeeper or you love butterfly gardens in your backyard, or you're into prairies or grassland, songbirds, pheasants, quail, whatever it might be. Um, I think that it has the opportunity to really interest and touch a bunch of people. Very cool. And then the two acres or more, uh, what states do they need to be in for yep. to potentially participate in that? So for the seed, a legacy program, and we have a number of habitat programs. That's kind of our flagship one. It is um, runs down from on the west from North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, and then comes all the way east to Ohio. Very okay? nice. And we are uh, getting ready to do our next expansion and addition of states. So, Mike, if somebody's listening and they're like, well, I'm, I'm not in that, you know, my state's not there. Just know that we started with two. We went to six, then 10, then 12. We're doing a thoughtful expansion so that as we grow, we have the capability of having a significant impact in the state, as opposed to just saying, okay, everybody, right. and we can kind of, you know, just a, a bunch of little projects here and there. Well, I would imagine that seed mix comes into play there as well. You know, a seed oh, mix yes. for northern Minnesota or northern North Dakota is going to be totally different than the panhandle yep. of Texas. Yeah. So if you go to our website, and there's a number of options on there. Right on the home page, you'll be able to click on boom, I want to make a gift that grows, or I want to learn more and sign up for Seed Legacy, or I can click on this free pollinator habitat establishment and management guide, which is really, really cool and provides step-by-step -step instructions. Anyway, if you click on the Seed Legacy one, your next step is you're going to click on your state. And you'll be able to learn about what the seed mixtures are for that state. Every single state 
has uniquely designed seed mixtures that are different. In some states, it's more than one seed mixture. Um, so it, it really is uh, very customized. There's a number of questions that you'll answer, uh, none of which are very burdensome, but there'll be a number of questions that you'll answer. And at the end, you submit it. It goes to our Habitat Project Coordinator. Uh, her name is Elsa, and Elsa will contact you and begin the process of having a conversation with you to learn about what are your goals and objectives? What do you want? Um, wh where's your site located? What's it currently planted to? Existing grass or its crops or whatever. And she will begin the process of working with you one-on-one -on -one, uh, to make sure that you have a great outcome like your project on the hillside that's been there for 17 years. Very, very cool. Well, Peter, as always, I think we maybe be multiplying our podcast future episodes every time we talk, which is fine by me. I like because, that. Yeah. Yes, because I think that what you do is at ultimately the core, the heart of pretty much everything bees, right? Like quality mm -hmm. habitat equals a quality bee. I mean, that, yeah. that, that I think everyone can agree with that. So yeah, um, I heard, no, go ahead. And if, and if somebody, you know, is like, well, yeah, okay, that's nice. Just know that when you think about all the ailments that honeybees and beekeepers are facing and all the things that we can't control, we can't control the weather, Varroa is proving to be about as complicated to control. You know, how do you kill an insect that's attached to an insect? Complicated uh, diseases, all those things. The one thing that we have the ability to control is habitat, forage. And the other thing that we know is that when your bees have access to high quality, highly nutritious forage, they're better able to handle all those things that we can't control. Right. Yep. A healthy bee makes a, uh, a strong bee. And a yep. strong bee can handle some aspects of uh, issues that a weak wouldn't. So I would totally agree. All yep. right. Well, I am going to, uh, we're going to go here, I guess. <laughs> and um, we will I'm definitely... be sending you lots of stuff. To, uh, yes. Uh, post editing uh, slip in here. <laughs> For sure. And we'll yeah. get uh, the next one, two, three, four podcast scheduled. So perfect. Once again, thank you so much. Yeah, Peter. you bet. Very enjoyable. And it's a really important topic. So let's keep chatting. Absolutely. Take care. All right. Thanks. Yep. There was nothing left to say.